welcome to Go Vote Omaha. This is a candidate forum for Legislative District 31, presented by the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha. I'm Jerry Simon, a League member and moderator for the forum. The League of Women Voters never supports or opposes political parties or candidates. We present this forum solely for voter education. Here's the format for our forum. Each candidate will have a one-minute opening statement. We'll follow that with questions and answers. Each candidate will have up to 90 seconds to answer every question. And the candidate who answers the question first will have up to 30 seconds of rebuttal time. We'll close our forum with a one-minute closing statement by each candidate. A timekeeper will alert the candidates when they should stop speaking. Before the forum this evening, the candidates drew lots to determine their initial speaking order, and I'll introduce them to you in that order now. There are two candidates running for Legislative District 31 in the unicameral, and they are Ian Swanson and Rick Kalowski. And we'll go right to our opening statements, beginning with Ian Swanson. Well, thank you so very much, uh, and thank you to the League for hosting this great event. Thank you, Senator Kalowski, for being here. <coughs> it's always great to talk about the issues that affect uh, the citizens of the LD31. It really is a privilege to run for the legislature, and I'm doing so for uh, the, the reason that our conservative district needs a conservative representing it in the legislature. And um, I, it's been such a privilege meeting the thousands of people as we knock on doors every single day to hear their concerns, to hear the things that they're going through, the challenges that we face as a state, and the, their ideas for solutions. Uh, that we can use to make the state a better place. And so, uh, fifth generation Nebraskan, uh, born and raised here, graduated from Millard North High School. I'm just so thrilled to be able to I have an opportunity to give back to my community and to implement some of the sol many solutions that I hear on a daily basis when I go and speak with uh, constituents in LD31. It's a great district. We live in a great state. And uh, we're all just trying our part to make sure that we can make it an even better place to live, to work, and to raise a family. Thank you. Rick Kolowski. Uh, thank you very much to the League for uh, hosting this uh, event this evening and for my opponent for being here as well as far as Mr. Swanson is concerned. My own uh, history is one of a lifelong uh, educator, 41 years in public education and uh, 38 years in the Millard Public Schools. The last 15 of those years in Millard, I was the founding principal of Millard West High School. I had some other elected positions uh, prior to that I served on the Papio NRD for two terms, uh, three years as chair of that body, uh, 2009 to 2012. I was on the four year, uh, four, I spent four years in the learning community and 2012 to 16, of course, <clears throat> my first term in the legislature. Deep community uh, connections uh, have always been a part of our life and uh, be it church, scouts, sports and other things. And I think the uh, vision, trust and leadership, the people in the district know me by has been a real telling point as far as the uh, past four years and the election before that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our first question. What is appropriate funding for community-based behavioral services? And we'll start with Rick Kolowski. The uh, topic of behavioral services are very important for uh, our community and I have a history <coughs> that goes back over 40 years in the district. At that time, we had a great many more opportunities uh, to seek services throughout the community with maybe 10 to 12 different agencies that existed at the time. Uh, the needs of students, the needs of parents, the needs of families are paramount in our district as well as all districts in the metro area. We're down to just a handful of agencies now that serve in any capacity and that burden, especially the financial burden, is much heavier upon the school districts to try to find assistance that they sometimes hire internally to uh, assist with uh, those, uh, those uh, different students and the families they have. We try to be as efficient and effective as we can as we're working with students with the needs that they have and it makes a big difference in their eventual success. I'm very uh, happy with the uh, direction we see things going as far as the school districts. They have the resources to deal with some of these things, but it's a mounting issue with uh, some of the dysfunctional families and issues that are going on in those families. They need the help, they need the assistance uh, of the school district and professionals to put their family back in order and to do the things they need to do together. Thank you. Ian Swanson. Appreciate the question. Um, the subject of community health and healthcare in general is a very critically important issue and it's one that I actually hear on a regular basis from constituents as I knock doors. 
Uh, we have a number of community health care facilities and agencies and nonprofits that help with this problem um, of getting the care that people need. We have a long way to go, though, in making sure that more people have access to care, uh, but also that they have reduced costs and more choice for, for patients wherever possible. And that's why um, I support market-based reforms that we can, we can implement that will enable that uh, choice and also um, add those incentives that will help reduce costs. Now, um, we've seen premiums skyrocketing. They continue to go up each year. That's a big problem. Um, and I'm, I'm committed to doing anything and everything that we can do uh, on, on a state level to help address those problems by uh, using the kinds of incentives uh, that, we, that we know will work. Market-based incentives like direct primary care that Senator Mervripi um, got passed into law this last year. I think there are, there are a number of things like that that we can do to help make sure that we increase access to care, that we add those market-based incentives to provide more choice, um, and make sure that people get the care that they need because obviously uh, health care is a critically important issue and it's, it definitely falls under the purview of state legislators. So I'm committed to the issue. I'm, I'm open to any solution that would help provide uh, care to people and uh, I, I also think that the state can do a lot better than, than what we're doing in terms of supporting community health right now. Thank you. Any rebuttal, Mr. Klauski? I think the, uh, the main issue uh, continues to be one of funding. We're in a very tight budgetary uh, horizon as we have the uh, legislature meet in the next uh, uh, biennium. Uh, we're going to be facing a lot of challenges and we'll have to make health and human services an important part of the decision making that we look into. And that's, again, connected to and delivered with the learning uh, of the um, school districts and and the and the state as a whole as far as education. Thank you. Here's our next question: What should be done about reforming our prison system? How can we pay for new staff and boosting current salaries? Things that a new report says are essential. And we'll start with Ian Swanson. Sure, I appreciate the question, and it's definitely a pressing issue in light of uh, the recent uh, happenings that we've had across the state with our correctional facilities. It's uh, one. Tragedy is too many, one assault of an officer is too many, and we need to do a much better job with it. And that's why I applaud, uh, first of all, Governor Ricketts' uh, appointment of a new corrections director, which I think they're, they're in the process of implementing a number of reforms that will address some of the things that you mentioned in your question. Uh, the number one thing that we need to do on the state level is address the staffing issue, which is a major issue. Uh, we can't afford to continue having the state corrections facilities be essentially a training ground uh, for the other localities. I have a number of friends that have, that have been corrections officers that are corrections officers and they went to work for the state corrections and then after they put in a couple of years, like so many, they realized that they could get a, a large pay increase by going pretty much anywhere else. And so we can save our state money in the long term uh, by making sure that we solve the staffing issues that face the, the Department of Corrections right now. Um, it's obviously a, a very difficult issue given the, the tensions uh, between uh, communities and police and we need to have uh, legislators that are committed to helping bridge that gap and bring people together um, and explaining the common sense solutions that we need in order to make sure that we ease those tensions, we protect our streets, and we make sure that we uh, actually try to correct in our correction systems uh, the bad behavior of the inmates and the people that are involved Thank you. with it. Rick Kalowski. I, uh, I stand against uh, privatization of uh, prisons. I think it uh, is, is counter to what we try to do or directions we want to go in our state. I believe the state has the responsibility to run their corrections facilities and to run them correctly. The larger question of the issue is site locations of the facilities, also the hiring, the training, and the retaining of the correction staff and finding more options for sentencing besides uh, just set time in prison that might be available. We have to look at the bigger picture of all of our probation services, parole officers, work release programs, all those things need to be examined as we look at the, uh, the question of corrections in our state and we have to remember the things that we don't, that we decide not to go for today can come back and haunt you in the very near future. That happened in the situation we find ourselves in now, and we have 
uh, a great deal of consternation in the state as we've had hearings in the last year that have pinpointed the lack of decision making on the part of uh, individuals in our state as far as the uh, corrections directions were concerned. So I'll stand again against prison privatization. Thank you. Andy Rebuttal, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Swanson. S certainly. I, first, I want to say that, that there's an important distinction to be made here. And uh, one, I would <clears throat> never vote uh, to reduce mandatory minimums for, man for uh, violent criminals. I think that would be a tragedy to release more people uh, like Nico Jenkins out onto the streets early. So first of all, we need to make a distinction between violent and nonviolent criminals. I'm a big fan of drug courts and mental health courts and these kinds of specialty courts that can make sure that people get the care that they need and actually address some of these problems for what they are health problems. Thank you. Here's our next question. What changes in sales taxes can be made to increase revenue without making our taxes more regressive than they already are? And we'll begin with Rick Kalowski. I appreciate the question, and it's one of uh, dear concern to all of us. As we look at the three-legged milk stool, uh, the whole aspect of property taxes uh, tied into sales tax and income taxes uh, is one that's uh, out of whack at the current time by anyone's judgment and uh, decision in the uh, state of Nebraska. As we look at the sales tax issue, my major concern is one of exemptions. I've heard more talk in the legislature in the last two or three years about the list of exemptions that exist for different bodies within the state asking questions about how they got to be in place and what we lose as far as the possibility of revenue coming into our state that would be useful to our total tax load. I think we need to have a re-examination of the exemption lists that exist, uh, much to the consternation, I'm sure, of some people within our state, and we need to open that book up, look at the, that voluminous list of those things that we're not taxing that uh, become impactful to the bottom line of our tax dollars in the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you. Ian Swanson. It's a, it's a great question, and the subject of taxation in general is something that I hear very frequently on the campaign trail. Uh, tax reform is my number one priority. 80% of people, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, on a daily basis when I knock doors, tell me that their taxes are too high. And it confirms the, the numerous studies that have come out recently saying that Nebraska has the, to the second highest total state tax burden of any state in the country. So first, I want to say, in regards to sales tax, that tax shifts are not tax cuts. So if we're going to be concerned about tax cuts and actually providing people tax relief, merely shifting tax burden from one person to another is not the right way to go. First, we need to address our spending problem. We need to seriously stop growing government at 6 and 7% a year uh, because every time you do that, you have to reach into somebody's pocket or find another source of revenue. The best way to grow revenues in our state is by growing the state. Economic development is a huge deal, and by making our tax code more competitive, we can draw businesses and individuals into the state, bringing in money, bringing in jobs, great high paying jobs, and making sure that as we grow over the next 10 years, that the revenues increase as well, which can help us pay for some of the priorities that we're talking about today. So I don't think that a sales tax shift is, is going to help uh, be a tax cut for the people that I talk, talk to on a daily basis. I'm concerned more about providing relief in whatever reform that take, I would, I would support that kind of reform. Thank you. Any rebuttal, Mr. Klaus? Well, I think the, uh, the question of how high our taxes are is one that you'd have to look at a number of different sources to examine. Saying that we're second highest in the, uh, in the United States is uh, uh, one opinion, but it's not the only one that's out there. You have to look at a lot of different uh, studies and uh, analysis by the professionals in the field to find that uh, we are up and down in different taxes in different ways, and how that impacts the, uh, the daily Nebraska can become a concern for all of us. Thank you. Here's our next question. Do you support advancing a proposal for charter schools in Nebraska? Do you support use of school vouchers or scholarships that really are the same thing as vouchers? 
We'll start with Ian Swanson. I appreciate the question. Uh, the fundamental question behind that is really how do we provide the best education for our kids that we possibly can? So first, I want to say that uh, as a graduate of Millard Public Schools, I really appreciate and respect uh, the, the, the need to have strong public schools, strong pri private schools, strong home schools, uh, and, and Millard mm -hmm. is is exemplary in terms of providing great choices of a variety of different curriculums to parents. Uh, second, education is a team sport. It requires the cooperation of parents and teachers and administrators, like Senator Klowski when he was principal of Node West, um, but also students and a number of other people. So we need to make sure that we empower and equip uh, parents to make the best decision as to what uh, school is, is best for their kids. So I'm I'm primarily concerned about making sure that in those districts like Omaha Public Schools where uh, large numbers of minority kids are graduating without being proficient, I am very much concerned about how we can provide them great choices of education. Um, and so I'm, I am open to scholarships and, and anything that we can do to give people access to great schools like Millard, um, to make sure that we can try to replicate the Millard model across the state. But again, the most important thing that we can consider is protecting that local control of school districts, school boards, um, but also partnering with parents to make sure that they get the, uh, they have the choice of, of the best schools. We have strong schools, we need to make them stronger, and that's a, that's a big priority of mine if and when I win this year. Thank you. Rick Kalowski. I uh, totally oppose the expansion of charter schools or vouchers in the uh, state, and uh, there's multiple reasons for that. One of them is the public schools can do more. There's a wide variety of quality existing in public schools across the state. Uh, we know uh, because of our Millard experience, Millard gets the best, one of the best bangs for the dollar than anyone in the state. One of the lowest per pupil average of spending uh, with the highest, some of the highest scores available in the state. The uh, charter school results are very spotty at best across the country. Use of vouchers or charter schools uh, we haven't even looked at some of the national materials that are available uh, across the state. Uh, the breaking ranks material from the secondary school principals is all about school improvement. I've been on two national Blue Ribbon School uh, committees that have been accepted. The first one in 1984 was Millard South. It was the first school in the state to be selected as a high school for a Blue Ribbon. And then in 2001, also Millard West uh, was accepted in the same way, and we're very proud of that. We need the right leaders to develop and the right culture and climate in buildings to improve student performance. Mr. Swanson has uh, designated charter schools as something that he has as one of his top goals in a radio program that was in 2015, and unless that's changed, uh, the use of the dollars for charter schools and vouchers is unacceptable to me. Thank you. Any rebuttal, Mr. Swanson? Certainly. Uh, I appreciate it. The, the biggest thing that we can do, anything that we can do to provide better choices, better, better access to education for our kids, it's absolutely essential. I don't believe that uh, top-down bureaucrat-driven policies like Common Core do any good in our schools whatsoever. <clears throat> the, talking about the results being spotty at best, I think that uh, local school boards and parents are the best people to make decisions for their students. And uh, also, I think that if you look at the track record, uh, of, of, of school choice in predominantly minority areas. I think that this track record is Thank actually you. a very good one. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. What should be done about the state budget shortfall? If your position is that you don't want to raise taxes or you want to reduce taxes further, tell us exactly which services you would cut to balance the budget and be very specific. We'll start with Rick Kolowski. Well, the uh, forecast at the current time is one that uh, will be challenging as we return to Lincoln in uh, January. Uh, our work will be cut out for us because the, uh, the work of the Appropriations Committee and the Revenue Committee will be paramount as far as the, uh, the daily decisions that we'll be making on the floor concerning the, the money that we'll have in our state. Being as efficient and as effective as we can possibly be is the goal that we have along with improved student performance as it comes to schools uh, or any of the agencies in Lincoln. Uh, we have to remember that we have 22,000 uh, graduates on a, a yearly basis in the state of Nebraska. Where those students go becomes an impact upon our state. We hope to keep them home. We hope to keep them in our state and have them take the courses and take the classes and take the
degrees that, that will keep them active and living in our state, becoming contributing tax member, tax paying members in the future. So I think it behooves every agency in the state with the leadership from all forms of government looking at the, uh, the issues of how we become more effective and more efficient as we move on. We're challenged also though by different things that have happened in our state. As we look at the TIOSA formula for school funding, uh, I've talked to Ron Witham, uh, who in 1990 was in charge of that, and we didn't even have the word poverty in that discussion. Thank you. Ian Swanson. I appreciate it. Um, I, think, I think that it's in incredibly important to uh, provide leadership on budgets, and budgets are, are primarily about priorities, and that's why I commend Governor Ricketts uh, for sending that letter to the various agencies telling them to tighten their budget to help address the budget shortfall. Um, I, I don't think that in order to keep students here, um, I don't think that raising taxes continually and spending more money is going to continue to make our state competitive. I think that it actually makes our state less competitive for millennials like myself to stay in the state. Now I'm staying for the long haul regardless because I'm a born and bred Nebraskan, but there are so many things from a public policy perspective that we can do to make sure we keep those, those kids here in the state, those people here in the state. In terms of uh, budget leadership, I think that the greatest thing that we need to do is continue having that conversation like Governor Ricketts said, and how to ba balance, um, tighten our, our belts, and uh, to make tough decisions. And so that's why we need to grow our state, making our tax climate a definitely more competitive, to bring outside investment, to grow our state with economic development. And that's the greatest thing that we can do to address our budget shortfall. Nebraska weathers the storm very well in terms of the recession. We're a great state, but we need to make sure that we don't continue to tax people, retirees, people on fixed incomes, and uh, young, young millennials out of the state, which is what we're doing if we don't change the tax policies that we have right now. Thank you. Rebuttal, Mr. Klowski. I think uh, the whole idea of growing the state is right on target. We have to do the things we can do to bring in uh, different opportunities uh, for families, uh, the issue of the, the Costco plant up in Fremont is a very hot topic, depending on how you look at it and the direction that we're going in the future. We have to open our, our minds and our arms and our attitudes toward the different issues that we can bring into the state to make a positive gain for everyone concerned. Thank you. Now it's time for our closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute, and we'll begin with Ian Swanson. Well, I just want to thank the league again. It's, it's really been a treat to be here, um, to participate in this forum. And I just will go back to my, my first point, which is that in this conservative district that LD31 is, we need to be represented by somebody who is a conservative and proud to be a conservative, somebody who's going to work with our governor, not work against him, uh, people who are going to work together, build coalitions across party lines, build coalitions between ur urban and rural senators. Um, as the child of somebody who grew up in small town Nebraska in Tacoma, I, I think I'm uniquely able to be able to bridge that gap. The other thing, I think that if you take any major issue of substance, I think that uh, my conservative principles are going to line up with the district. I'm the only pro-life candidate in this race. I'm the only candidate in this race uh, committed to doing the things that we need to do to reduce taxes and not just shift them. Uh, I, I'm the only candidate in this race who is dedicated to working with our governor on these issues. And I just appreciate, I would appreciate the opportunity to serve LD31 in the legislature. We, we're a great state. We have some work to do to make Thank sure you. that we continue to be a great state. And I ask for your vote. Thank you. Rick Kolowski. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to run for re-election in District 31. I think I've got three major goals that I've always talked about. To keep the American dream alive for all who seek it. Secondly, to make a positive difference in Lincoln. And thirdly, to improve the quality of life for all Nebraska citizens uh, to represent District 31 and the state. Putting into, together the vision, the trust, and the proven leadership that I've exhibited uh, over my entire career uh, I think that uh, speaks for itself. One last statement, wisdom is essentially discrimination, uh, the capacity to see what is important in the long run and to choose our course of action accordingly. Together we can make Nebraska an even greater place to live. Thank you. Thank you. 
This concludes our candidate forum for Legislative Di District 31. The League of Women Voters would like to thank both the candidates for their participation. And we'd like to remind you that we have some upcoming forums that will be airing uh, later in the month. Um, on September 20th, we'll be airing Legislative District 39. The candidates are Lou Ann Linehan and Bill Armbrust. On September 26th, we will have a live forum that will be for the Omaha Public School District Boards, District 1 and 3. And the candidates there are um, Yolanda Williams, Ricky Smith in District 1, Alex Gates, and Ben Perlin in District 3. And then September 27th, we will have the Douglas County Commission Board District 5 candidates, Mark Kraft and Mary Jane Trumpter. Um, October 14th as well, we will have a forum in conjunction with the Omaha Press Club. That's at, um, for, for Congressional District 2 with uh, the candidates are Brad Ashford and Don Bacon, and that will be at noon at the Press Club. Anyone can attend. It is a paid luncheon, so you do need to uh, RSVP and let them know that you'd like to attend that forum. Uh, we also have an upcoming, um, we'd like to let, let our uh, viewers know that we have done a series on the death penalty for uh, viewers to watch. We did three programs, one on morality and justice, one on lethal injection and legal issues, and one on religion and the death penalty. And those are available for you to watch at any time on our YouTube channel. You can find those programs with a link through our website, which is omahalwv.org. And we also want to remind you that, again, the League of Women Voters never supports or opposes political parties or candidates. We do study issues, however, and we often take positions and action on those issues. Um, contact information is on your screen now for the League of Women Voters. You can contact us at omahalwv uh, at gmail.com and go to our website at omahalwv.org. For the League of Women Voters, I'm Jerry Simon reminding you to inform yourself about the issues and the candidates. And on Tuesday, November 8th, go vote Omaha.